America makes at least let me speak for myself America made me aware of myself in ways I hadn't thought of right as a uh, as a black woman um he and is so- very hot tonight <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to this evening's masterclass conversation uh, called Restage, Contemplations on Decolonizing American Theater Design. This masterclass was conceptualized by American Theater Wing Advisory Committee member Clint Ramos. His creativity was empowering for this conversation and he invited this fantastic panel of artists in our field. And joining Clint for the conversation tonight, and you'll meet them just a little bit later, is Didi Aite, Mimi Lien, and Ricardo Hernandez. Tonight, this panel will explore culture, identity, and the impact of decentering the dominant culture and selected theater designs and practices. Our artists will be discussing design as a whole while considering the lens of how we can, how we can begin to discuss, ask questions, and have conversations on decentralizing the white narrative in theater design. So now, I, it is my absolute pleasure, I'd love to invite the panel to come on the screen together as I introduce each of the designers joining us today. So leading and guiding our conversation tonight is Clint Ramos. He is a Tony Award, Obie Award, Lucille Lortel, Henry Hughes, Outer Critics Circle and Drama Desk Award winning set and costume designer. Selected productions include Violet, Elephant Man, Eclipsed, Sunday in the Park with George, Once on the Silence, Slave Play and so much more. He's designed hundreds of productions in theater, opera and dance. And he has uh, work that is being represented on both Netflix and uh, the Respect, the Aretha Franklin biopic starring Jennifer Hudson premiering this winter. Clint is also the head of design and production at Fordham University. And I know we have lots of Fordham students joining us here tonight. So welcome to all of them and is on the advisory committee of the American Theater Wing. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Didi Aite. She is a costume designer whose credits both on and off Broadway include a soldier's play, slave play, American Son, Children of a Lesser God, Secret Life of Bees, Tony Stone, By the Way, Meet Vera Stark, and many more. She has worked in television with Netflix, Comedy Central, and Fox Shortcoms. She has received an Obie, Lucille Lortel, Helen Hayes, Theater Bay Area, and Jeff Award, along with four Drama Desk nominations. Welcome, Didi. Next, we have Ricardo Hernandez, who is an Obie Award winner and Tony Award nominee, along with several, several other accolades. He has designed scenery for more than 250 productions around the world and has worked both on and off Broadway with his most recent Broadway design being for Jagged Little Pill. Additionally, he has worked at every major nonprofit theater in the country and his international credits include productions for the Abbey Theater, Moscow Art Theater, National Theater of Great Britain and Royal Court to name a few. He is also an associate professor adjunct at the Yale School of Drama and a big shout out. I know there are a lot of Yale students joining us here today as well. Mimi Lien is next. She is a designer of sets and environments for theater, dance, and opera, a co-founder of Jack, a performance art space in Brooklyn. Selected projects include Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812, Fairview, and Octoroon and True West. She is a recipient of a Tony Award, an Obie Award for Sustained Excellence, Drama Desk, Lucille Lortel, Outer Critics Circle, Henry Hughes Design Award, and in 2015, she was named a MacArthur Fellow, the first stage designer ever to achieve this distinction. This is such a powerhouse group of designers who are here tonight. We are so lucky to have all of you. So on behalf of the American Theater Wing, on behalf of all the attendees and everyone joining us tonight, thank you for sharing your time. And it is my absolute pleasure to turn this masterclass conversation over to Clint. Thanks, Megan. Um, I just want to say thank you to the American Theatre Wing, to David, Heather, Megan, Alicia, uh, Melissa, Ian, Kayla, and Jacob. Um, I um, want to do a a short land acknowledgement uh, before we start. We acknowledge that the land that the American Theatre Wing, Broadway and Off-Broadway is on, is the traditional homelands of the Muncie Lenape people. We encourage everyone who engages with these institutions to think about these questions created by Dakota visual artist Angela Two Stars and Navajo theater artist Rihanna Yazi. What is your intent being on this land and in this community? How will you use the new resources you gain by being here? How will you replace the things that you take from here? How will you carry the knowledge of the Native people present, past, and future into the work that you do? And finally, how will you increase indigenous power? 
I also want to acknowledge that the social justice reckoning that we are experiencing as a nation is powered by the fight for Black lives. We acknowledge the centuries of oppression brought on Black bodies and how that brings us to where we are today. Black lives matter. And specifically today, we say that the fight for justice for Breonna Taylor is not over. Before we begin, um, I'd like to read a paragraph from the BIPOC Principles for Building Anti-Racist Theater Systems, a document released by hundreds of BIPOC theater workers on July 8th, 2020. Um, and I've asked Didi to read this for us. As the calls for long overdue change sweep every aspect of our society, we as Black, Indigenous, and people of color theater workers are meeting the moment developing a new social contract for our work environments that cares for and sustains, our, and sustains our artistry and lives. We insist on this reckoning precisely because of the successes of those artists of colors working in the theater, as those victories have come at a steep cost. Our love of theater has often meant surviving an industry-wide culture of fear, poisoned by racism and its intersecting oppressions. But when we lift the veil of white supremacy, we know how best to support our theatrical expressions, our culture, and ourselves. We are resilient. We carry ancestral wisdom. We call for transformative measures guided by principles of self-determination, presence, joy, access, protection, transparency, and integrity in the spirit of independence from our colonized past and present. Thanks, Didi. Um, hi, friends. I'm just going to ask Hi. like Mimi and Ricardo to <laughs> mute. Hi. Hi. Excellent. <laughs> um, I just wanted to sort of like uh, acknowledge how anxious I was because, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of everyone's work here. But also, um, you know, I think this is something that we all have been sort of like talking about in our circles, especially because we're all educators also. But like, you know, nobody has really sort of... Um, I, I, I guess there isn't a path for what we're about to talk about. So I think I want to acknowledge that this is just um, us like really contemplating what these paths could be, you know, but also like acknowledging that, um, that I don't even think there has been a first step towards like this idea of decolonizing American theater design. But before that, I just want to sort of check in, um, maybe ask where you're zooming in from, uh, uh, maybe ask, you know, uh, what's giving you joy these days, you know? And I know that we all know each other because we're also doing like work, you know, outside of this, uh, like social justice work. Um, but like, I don't really think like I know all of you. So maybe, maybe tell me where your parents met, you know? Um, I'll start. Uh, so I'm calling in, I'm zooming in from the Berkshires. Uh, traditional territory of the Mohegan people. Um, what's giving me joy these days is my little daughter. Um, she's, uh, she's three and, uh, you know, she's like um, exploring the woods, you know, um, and, um, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I'm from the Philippines originally. Uh, my parents met in Manila. Um, my mother was a, a young lawyer and my father was, um, like chased her around outside the courts, you know, and they got married in like in, in a very short amount of time. So the courtship is very short. Um, Didi. All right, I'll, I'll go. Um, Didi Aite, I'm originally from Ghana, born and raised, land of the best jollof rice. My Nigerian friends, just putting that out there. Um, my parents <laughs> met in Ghana. Um, what is bringing me joy? Whew. You know, this week has been very heavy, like yesterday especially. Um, but what brings me joy and has been bringing me joy has been finding just moments with people I love and just sort of like kicking, just like talking and, and sharing some of our hurts, our wounds, um, and just being open with each other. Um, yeah. Should I pass it on? Yeah, do it. Mimi. <laughs> Hi. Hi, uh, Mimi Lian. I'm calling in from Clinton Hill, Brooklyn. Um, and I, I, like Clint, I have young, I have two-year-old twins. 
two boys. And so they are definitely <laughs> the bringers of, of joy and pain <laughs> on, a, <laughs> on an hourly basis. Um, but certainly, yeah, you know, like turning over the rock and finding, you know, looking at the worms and the delight, the delight um, is definitely keeping me going. Um, my parents uh, were born, uh, well, so they, they were fr from a southern province in China called Fujian province. And my, my mother lived in the village at the top of the mountain. And my father's family was from this sort of small city at the bottom of the mountain and, and their, uh, their fathers knew each other. And after, um, uh, in the, in the mid 1940s, they, they fled to Taiwan actually. And so they, they actually met because their fathers introduced each other uh, because they knew each other, uh, you know, through their work. Um, so that's, that's how they met. Uh, so they were engaged in Taiwan and then they came to the U.S. for graduate school and then they got married in Carbondale, Illinois. Amazing. Hi, Ricardo. Hi, Glant. Hi, everyone. I am calling in from uh, Hamden, Connecticut. Um, I see my, uh, I am from Havana, Cuba. I grew up in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, my parents, it's a long story, I'll keep it short. They met in Cuba. My mom is Argentina, Argentinian. She, grew, she was born in Santa Fe, which is a province north of um, uh, Buenos Aires, uh, indigenous. And uh, she was, quote unquote, adopted by a family of doctors who were Marxists. And we're talking about now the late 50s. And she decided to take a journey with them to revolutionary Cuba, which the revolution triumphed in 1959. And she came over with the family in 1960, which is where she met uh, my father, who was an opera singer. So my, my mother was a communist. My father was not. And just take it from there. Um, it was a complex relationship, to say the least. Um, but I was very fortunate to have the, you know, the upbringing of, on my father's side, in opera and that, that much, and Cuba. And for my mother, I would say awareness of social justice, if I may say that, simply because of her upbringing. And yeah, that's, that's that family history. What brings me joy today is... I'm really excited by the conversations we're having at, at school. They're very difficult, but uh, very exciting and full of future. And also talking to my family at home. We've been together since the pandemic hit. And we've had very, very, very difficult conversations. And for that, I'm very thankful. I'm thankful to my wife and I'm, I'm thankful to, to, to my sons. And I'm also thankful to, to my daughters for having the opportunity to have these very difficult conversations and, and also aware that I keep failing. And that's, that's my journey to, to, to take. Mm. It's interesting that you say that you keep failing because, you know, like I only view you as a success, right? <laughs> but I also feel like I think it's like it is literally the thing that I do every day, right? Like I step on mud, um, just like trying to like navigate, uh, you know, uh, both the pandemic and um, the sort of like work that's ahead. Um, you know, I think part of why I like um, I was like, you know, when I reached out to all of you, it was like thinking about this is because a lot of the institutions that we belong to have been kind of like throwing this word around, like we need to decolonize this thing. And, you know, and I remember one of our colleagues saying, I don't even know what that means, because the people who are saying decolonize are, look like what our colonizers were, right? And so I kind of like looked at like, uh, you know, all of like what, what we think this process 
is and what what the meaning of it is. And um, there was one uh, definition from the uh, Consortium of Museums that I thought was really great, where it, where it says decolonization is a process that institutions undergo to expand the perspectives they portray beyond those of the do dominant cultural group, particularly white colonizers. And so uh, to me, that was, you know, that seemed to sort of encompass what would be the general kind of rubric that uh, that 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 you know that institutions are asking um, uh, uh, of us and of its practitioners. Um, a lot of people actually sent us questions, and so maybe I should just like launch, you know, into those questions. Unless you know, you all want to share something. Like, ha have you been posed this question recently by institutions you belong to? I haven't. But I was having a conversation with my brother and we were discussing how, you know, colonization is actually about power and identifying that and recognizing, and for me at least, it's recognizing that and, and questioning how to break away from that. Because I think you have to recognize it in order to, or you have to study it in order to, to dismantle it, right? So when you think of education, um, I would think that in America, most schools teach you, you know, white American theater. It, they teach you white stage set design, right? There isn't necessarily room for like, what about your black artists or your like Latinx artists, right? There's not a lot of room created for these artists in our educational system. And I do think it's important to recognize and study, you know, white, des um, white American design um, in order to sort of like rebuke it or to, um, to expand beyond that. But I think it's something that as educators, we can start to sort of, to, to create more space and to, and to look past it, like to, to, create, to create more um, for our students to recognize that it's a much bigger world, right? In some ways, I'm quite privileged because that growing up in Ghana, I'm coming with the understanding that my existence doesn't start in America, right? Like my story did not start here. So also when I'm approaching my shows or my work, Intrinsic, that's happening, right? I know for Black people, their history doesn't start in America. Their history started on the continent. And so I'm considering that. And in some ways, I'm, I feel privileged to be able to do that because my sort of norm or what, what was mainstream in my childhood wasn't white America. So it's, mm. it's easier for me to tap into that. I don't know how um, for you, it's for you guys, it's been. You know, we've begun those conversations at school, for sure, at the, at the drama school. And the big question right now is, you know, we have seminars, we have classes, and it's what, what are the steps that we're going to take right now as faculty, as students, as, 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 as a collective, that it is that institution, to take these questions, and they're very difficult, as you know, and implement them into something that can forge forward. And how to forge that forwardness is, is, is it's very complex. Um, and like, mm -hmm. Didi, you know, I'm, 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 I'm Cuban, I'm Argentinian, I'm both actually. And I am aware, very aware of my education. Uh, as I already said, my father was an opera singer, so my upbringing comes from that world. But at the same time, I had my mother who, and I grew up in Argentina where I was able to, to, to read literature from, from, that is so rich in South America. That was nothing uh, related to this other world that I knew, which is, you know, the Western culture or, or the opera world. And it has taken me years to reach back to what I would consider, well, this, this is what I'm tapping into. This is my, my, my Cubanness or my Argentinianness. And how do I bring that to the conversation when it comes to quote unquote teaching design? Because I am aware that as Didi already said, that a lot of the things that have been taught for many decades, for many, for a long time actually, it's a, it's a specific structure. It's a specific aesthetic system that only applies to one thing. And, you know, recently I read this, this, this comment by, I hope I, I'm pronouncing the name properly, so my apology if, if I don't, Dana or Dana Abdullah, who said, the coloniality is about shattering the familiar. 
that blew my mind because in many ways I think all four of us have been doing that. And and I think we have to be irreverent when we do that shattering. Because the opposite side, the opposite or the contradictory, the dialectical opposition to what has been taught to us, very few people have been able to do, or even given the chance, the opportunity to do that. I I love being in a position where I can actually do that kind of dismantling because it is in that dismantling that I began to find my own voice in quote unquote American design mm. because it gave me the tools and the strength to go against it and find the opposition, find the, what was, what was silenced, what was not allowed to be said, what was not allowed to be portrayed. And that gave me a great sense of empowerment to find my voice. And in my case, with people like Dorsey Wolf, Robert Woodruff, and many others. And that gave me, uh, uh, I'm going to say the word again, an irreverence. Mm. And I, I, in the conversation that we're having in our school right now, I want to make sure that that is on the table so that they feel empowered that they, to do that, to begin chipping away, to see what they have inside. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm. Mimi, do you have yeah. thoughts around this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really appreciate starting with the the sort of trying to define the word because I think yeah. it can very easily these days can be thrown around as a kind of jargon or it starts to, you know, the, the meaning is slippery. It probably means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Mm, um, yes. and it also feels like it could be, a, you know, it's something that you can say and, and feel like you're saying the right thing, but you, but yes, what are yes. we really saying? Um, and, but for, for me, when I was thinking about it earlier, I, I, I appreciated the, the, ability through thinking about it to take kind of take a step back like before even mm. thinking about theater design or before even thinking about theater like for for me what's useful about saying you know decolonizing versus you know anti-racist is like you know the the conversations about race in this in this country are so intense right now mm. but when i think about trying to define decolonization for myself it makes me think about it on a global level and mm. really to think about it about like the, the permeation of like aesthetic of like Eurocentric aesthetics throughout the world, like on every continent. Um, so when I think about, you know, my parent, you know, my, my mother who grew up in Taiwan and aspired to move to America, like there is a, an aesthetic ideal of whiteness you know, that mm, she yes. has certainly communicated to me, you know, like from things yes. about like makeup and skin lightening creams and, yes. you know, body modification to, you know, like literally there's this specific surgical procedure that's popular um, in Taiwan yeah. and maybe other Asian countries about like, you know, literally eyelids. Make eyelids. Yeah. Making your eyelids so that they are double, you know, instead of the single, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but like these things that like, so the, it just, it, it's, I find it useful to think about the enormity yeah. of, of the, of the problem and, and, and aesthetics really, and how it, in, how it impacts aesthetics um, yeah. and an aesthetic ideal, and then kind of bringing it back to then, you know, theater as a reflection of that society and those, you know, yes. societal aesthetics and design as then, you know, the, the container within, yes. we are work, within which we are working. Thank you for saying that, Mimi, because I feel like I, when I first reached out to you all, I, I said, I, I, you know, they, they, they want me to do this master class, but I feel I'm like, I'm actually questioning the, the, A, being a master of something that I'm, I'm now trying to unlearn, you know, and when you say sort of like in this, when you position it globally, I think part of the, the awe that I have, right, is when you look at the, uh, just in terms of numbers, 
the population of, let's just say white people in the West, right? A bit, well, just white people, it's 11.8% and has never gone above like 20% in the whole world throughout centuries. To me, what's profound about that is how that over time had become the dominating force, you know? And so, yes, we have to acknowledge all of that, right? And But I also, what I what I love about what you all are saying is that there is this, sense that it's really not about undoing all of this stuff, but acknowledging the the sort of the, the strings that got attached along the way and how we sort of like tease that out. You know, I think part of um, the big questions that I have right now is like, you know, there is a clear sort of move to decolonize design, design in its isolation, right? Like design in the world, like as, as, as a thing. But our particular kind of design is so devoted to the bigger sort of envelope that contains that particular design. So um, do we begin actually with the canon? Do we begin there? Or where, where do you think we should, where, where should we look at as a source of like the primary excavation that we should do? I think when you say canon though, it's like what, you know, what, how are you defining the canon? To me, my canon isn't, it's not just like American plays, right? So I think that, I mean, that is an, an individual choice, um, but you know, like yeah, what I, is the I, canon, I, you know what I mean? Right. So I'm saying the, the dominant canon right now, like mm -hmm. Shakespeare, Chekhov, and everything that, you know, that is aligned to that or extracted from that in a way, you know, is that where we, is that where we look at, you know, canonical devotion? To I mean, there are literally theaters devoted to Shakespeare, right? Like, and, and so is, like, where do we even begin is my question, you know? Um, uh, uh, do we begin at the the envelope that's containing us and our work, you know, which is indeed the American theater. You know. I mean, when I was looking through my work and projects and trying to choose which images to, to share, I definitely, you know, and I think we were asked to submit images that were both, you know, dealing with decolonizing, but also those that dealt, that were working within a kind of colonized aesthetic, right? right? Like right, this yeah, notion yeah. that we have to, in order to begin the counter narrative, you have to know what's out there already. Right. Um, so I, 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 thought, I thought that was very interesting to kind of look at my body of work through that lens and be like, yeah. which projects fall in which category. And I and you know, of course, I found a lot of work that is working within, uh, one might say, you know, or Eurocentric aesthetics. And I guess there were a couple of projects um, that stood out to me as ones that uh, were like specifically calling attention to that. Like, for example, like I don't know, maybe I can I can call for a first yes. slide. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is that okay, yeah, or did yeah, you want to? Yeah, yeah, no, go ahead, Vivi. This is this is exactly what it is. Um, our friends at the American Theater Wing are on the ready. Let's call on those images. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, so I thought about um, this play, Fairview, uh, by Jackie Sibley's Drury, um, which is number twenty-three, um, and it's you know the design for this play literally was like we wanted to convey whiteness, like Pottery Barn, uh, Restoration Hardware, uh, like that was, you know, and actually one of the main inspirations for this design is actually O.J. Simpson's house. Where there's wow. this amazing documentary where he's wearing like a beige sweater. He's like wearing all beige and he's like in front of his entirely beige um, house. And, um, and, you know, this, this piece is, is dealing, you know, very much talking about whiteness as in an attempt to, you know, to reckon with, to acknowledge it in order to dismantle it, you know? Yeah, I love that because I think a lot of um, the, 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 the thing that we're talking about is, you know, it, uh, is related to sort of like, um, uh, some sort of uh, desire for purity, which I don't think is 
uh, for me at least, what decolonizing is about, you know, because I think whatever that is, whatever that pure, that desire for purity is, goes back, is very close to, you know, the, the nativist movements of here in the, uh, um, uh, in America. And I'm not talking about native people, I'm talking about white people. Um, so I think part of um, what I, what I think was, I love that show and I love that design because absolutely the 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 mandate was clear, you know. Um, I guess my question to all of you is that we talked about where, you know, who we are as human beings. And this is a question that actually also part of this question was given to us. Um, how do you find some sort of honesty uh, to your real, to your true selves? And I know this is really deep or maybe it's not. And your experiences and your ancestral lineage in um in an industry where the the dominant narrative is so pervasive you know in the theater how do you stay true to yourselves that way you know how do we how do we do that yes ricardo and be before we jump into that one i i want to say something about what you just asked before which is about the canon i i would like to propose a question for everybody obviously which is, it is one thing to talk about the classics, and it is another thing to talk about the aesthetic values that have been shoved into these classics. They're not <laughs> the same. They are not the same thing, mm -hmm. because you mentioned, for example, the name Chekhov. But Chekhov has been tormented by a very specific icono iconography, that when you think about it, and if you liberate the text from that iconography, what remains is a deeply humanist point of view about life, existence. So I think we should be very uh, 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 careful not to confuse the aesthetic values that have been shoved down into these works and take the text away, free them in a way from that iconography so that young designers, rising BIPOC designers, everybody can take these texts and literally we discover them without the imprint of this aesthetic system or system of structures of beauty, for example, mm -hmm. of prettiness, or oh, we're gonna do it this way, we're gonna have the samovar, we're gonna have the hanging birch trees, give me a break. We all know that Chekhov is deeper than that. So I would like, for, my, for, for, for the purpose of the question, I said, I don't know, I don't have an answer yet, but I think, Perhaps if you do tackle an Anton Chakov play in the classroom and you counterpointed following with, let's say, a brand new play, like a Susan Laurie Parks, for example, I think we're gonna find uh, uh, closeness in, 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 in what they're doing with their plays. Though they're very, very, very different. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I, I, I will, I, I, I'm very skittish about literally talking about the aesthetics that have been shoved into che someone like Chekhov and those texts. I think we, 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 we as designers, directors, performers, we can dive much deeper into those texts. And we all know that. Mm -hmm. So Ricardo, yeah. it sounds like it's a conscious unlearning or undoing of those aesthetics, right? I think, I think so. as a designer, you have to like, give yourself that room. You have to consciously try to unlearn those aesthetics that have been shoved down your throat, whether in grad school, on, you know, exactly. undergrad, even you know, high school. Exactly, because for example, if we were to only, anal I'm, going, I'm, I'm only fixating on Chekhov because Clint, you brought up the name, but if we're only doing research Chekhov, mm -hmm the period that he comes from, the, all the beautiful costumes, all, all of that, we're, we are bound to, in a way, possibly create an extension of that aesthetic form that was not even, I don't think is his. And we're robbing ourselves from the interpretation that we have in the 21st century to rediscover these pieces. These pieces are universal. And I think the, the issue is that something has been, uh, again, shoved down into his work that we need to, to do this point and learn what that is so that we can rediscover that. And at the same time that we know how to unlearn that, we can then tackle contemporary pieces 
modern pieces, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that, to me, is part of the decolonizing uh, 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 process that we need to do. Right. And I, I would actually all just like build on to that, Ricardo. Yeah. I mean, part of my argument is that I, I you know, in dismantling and in, in decolonizing, it's really not about burning down all of these white canonical plays that we've, you know, it's actually just n maybe a world where we decenter it because through conquest, I, I, what my my argument is like, how many classics have we actually? classics how many works have we actually overlooked like shakuntala for instance yeah. you know the little toy cart in, in in the sanskrit you know so how have we um positioned these uh these plays according to the dominant culture that's number one and i completely agree with you because we are bound this is the system that we're in and i and i and i'm of the mind you know i don't know how you guys feel that i can actually critique the system while belonging to it but I, in 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 a way you know you can't throw everything out right but so in in terms of aesthetics how can you as mimi did how can you comment on uh the a the dominant culture and b the sort of uh uh narration the the implementation of the importance of this piece you know through a rethought aesthetic you know what i mean and so i think part of what i i want to sort of like think about is 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 how do we maneuver around this because the thing is not going to change overnight right like right. like we're, we're, we're we are teaching what we're teaching we are teaching what we know as we sort of like question it you know and we're practicing a system we're, we're actually practicing design through a system that is institutional you know the way we do fittings the way we 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 do um uh uh bid sessions uh the way we deal with with the way the the folks who manufacture our designs like and all of that is rooted in a particular kind of system rooted in capitalism rooted in all of that you know so i guess i think what i love about what you said is that there is a way to sort of decolonize within it you yes. know um and i and i would also say that i agree with you into that we and i say we as part of institutions we have been very close about expanding other cultures mm -hmm. outside of the dominant uh, as you know uh, to use the word the canon i think there is amazing work out there that in our laziness we ourselves perhaps have not looked into that it should be brought back into the conversation so you can have a dialectical back and forth between that which has existed and there's a reason why they're there and that which has existed also but silenced and very yes. few people have done that work in order for me to for all of us and the students to know oh my god there's so much more than anton chekhov that's a fact mm -hmm. and i think there's there has been a, a i, I want to call i don't know that it, the word is laziness but an acceptance that this is the way things are to the Western culture, to the canon, yeah. to everything. And literally, the other has been shoved aside. That's a crime. Well, it's, yeah. I think the word for that is oppression. Oppression, absolutely. Yeah. But I think oppression. we also have to recognize that we're also giving power to these things, right? Even like whatever, so the classics, right? We, you cannot, like we are giving power away. We're giving the power to these sort of like, bodies of work and saying like oh they matter they're all, the end all and be all of it and i think you have to take some of that power back right like you have to consciously say you know what no this this other work is just as important is just as valid and so i'm going to explore it and i'm going to practice it yeah i mean i think it's partially the neglect of work that's outside of the canon is partially laziness but i think partially it's perpetuated by the business model of the American theater, because certainly one reason that I've heard in educational institutions about why we keep doing Chekhov and Shakespeare is because, oh, you know, we want to give students a project in their portfolio that other people will yes. know, you yes. know, 
Yeah. So like when there's a portfolio review, then like then other people will know it. And if you do something that other people don't know, then, you know, maybe your career will, you know, will not be furthered in the same way. So I feel like it's, it's perpetuated by these like seemingly logistical and like businessy things, but it, it, it really has an impact. Can I follow that? I'm sorry. Yeah, you go ahead, Ricardo. I was going to say to follow Mimi's thing, I would say, uh, Mimi's thought is that it is pretty arrogant to think of theater as American theater. Yeah. It is very arrogant. Those are, the, those are the only aesthetic volumes that we should follow when we are not only teaching, but doing our own work. The world is vast. Well, to think of theater really, as theater. Huh? To think of theater as theater, the way we understand exactly. what theater is. Mm-hmm. You know, there's so exactly. many... There are so many, like the work, for instance, that I was talking to you about this recording that Diana Taylor is doing with the Hemispheric Institute, excavating ancient, you know, methods of performance where the, the, the root of why they perform goes beyond what we understand theater to be, like ritual and all of it. Right, know? that's right. Yes. Um, talking about silencing, I want to actually, you know, uh, go to this question and I want to ask Mimi and Didi about this because uh, 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 somebody sent us a question and it made me really think that how can you, can you talk a little bit about the gendered aspect of the American theater's colonized presence and how, how this affects the way you work but as women of color, but also how how we can move forward in terms of, because this is another kind of, of quote unquote colonization, how we can move forward, uh, how you can see a future uh, that sort of rejiggers the balance. A future that rejiggers the balance. <laughs> yeah. That's I a know, heavy one, Clint. That is heavy. <laughs> I, I mean, I'll start with the first part. I will say, you know, America makes at least let me speak for myself america made me aware of myself in ways i hadn't thought of right as a Whoa. as a black woman um she and is so, very hot tonight <laughs> <laughs> and it, it it's taken a, a lot of years to recognize that the way that america might react to me isn't actually who i am right and so i came to america with a different idea of who i was because i grew up around everyone that essentially looked like me i grew up around black people but then even with sort of like the passive or seemingly positive compliments, like, oh, you speak so well, or, oh, you're so smart, or, oh, you're so talented. It's like, why are you so surprised, right? So America makes sure you aware of yourself in a way that is actually quite harmful. And you have to sort of go through the process of unlearning that, at least for me, I had to, to recognize that I don't need to try to prove myself because of how America is reacting to me. And so with that, I can sort of like try to like listen to my inner voice and, and not lean into the idea that when America sees me, they, when they see me as being outspoken, they're seeing like an angry black woman. I have to sort of unlearn and dissociate myself from that. I'm, I can just acknowledge that I am showing up in the fullness of myself as an artist and that is enough for me, yeah. I, you know what you just basically said, I think there is a, at least for me, part of that consciousness and part of what, what you know, this, this dialogue, this, 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 what, exactly what you just said, um, somehow permeates, you know, not only the way we work, but the work itself, you know what I mean? And, and no, it's wonderful. I mean, we're going to look at your work in a little bit, but like, Mimi, can you talk a little bit about sort of like this, this the gendered aspect of working in the theater, you know? Yeah, American I mean, theater. by that same token, I mean, I, I grew up in America. I think I might be the only one of us that was born here. Um, but, yeah. you know, uh, on the flip side, right, the stereotypes that exist about Asian women, um, you know, in this country and in a lot of other places, certainly that's something that um, that I felt like I've had to battle against, you know, and working as a set designer, which is, a you know, a traditionally like dominated by uh, by males. And so that's that's something that I feel like I've constantly been uh, kind of up against. Um, I think that the, the question that like the original question 
I mean, the genderedness of America, I feel like it just, it kind of goes hand, hand in hand. I mean, like, uh, you know, the white, ma- the white male, like those two things kind of go, go together in terms of the dominance uh, of the aesthetics and presence. And so, yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, yeah. I think intersection, you know, the intersectionality of it is, is unavoidable. So here's the question. What are the things, strategies, approaches to work related to what we're talking about that you notice in your work and process um, or practice in general um, that, you, uh, um, uh, uh, that you notice today that were not present maybe five years ago or present in your consciousness five years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago? You know, like, I think I can also extend this question by saying, like, what do you look forward to once we go back to, like, work? I mean, I know we're working right now, but, like, I think once we go back to, 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 to practice, uh, first part is what are the approaches, the methodologies that you, that you employ now, especially with this, I wouldn't say a new consciousness, but as, as we're paying attention to this particular kind of consciousness, um, uh, and, and how different is that from the work that you did maybe 10 years ago, you know? I don't know. I don't, I, I'll, I'll say this, that um, I think this is part of uh, this conversation of decolonizing, uh, I would say, set design. Because we all know that set design is a very specific thing that denotes a specific location. And we have tried to, uh, or we've been taught to illustrate those locations. So if you have verge on the other side of that illustration, you're going to be called conceptual from the get-go. And I find that very insulting, by the way, in my opinion. I can only speak for myself. Because what we're trying to do with a director, with a group, the collective that is the design team in the process is to open up and we discover if it is a classic or if it's a brand new piece, you use all the tools at your disposal of today's world from philosophy to iconography, you name it. Like for example, the Mimi, the, the, the work that Mimi just showed, you, you can critique using the tool or, or, or the structure of what we used to call, I, I use it in the past tense, by the way, set design. There's something more than that. There's a space. There's a world in which something can happen, in which the words can literally explode, that we as the audience can all understand. So we're not back down, bogged down by the little details that may not add anything to the story. Some of them, of course, are very, very, very important. But I think, for me, the journey that I have taken in taking away, chipping away at what we call scenic design in order to find this other space that is authentic or truthful, whatever you want to, whatever adjective you want to use, I find that thrilling. And I know that at times, most of the time, the critics are going to say, well, where are we? I don't understand where we are. I say, well, listen to the words and pay attention to the whole thing live it be entranced by it so i i personally want to continue that journey of chipping away until what remains is something that is truly truly necessary and essential to tell a very specific story and some of them are going to be very political most of them are so how do we do that today i don't have the answer because we're not in post pandemic yet but i'm looking forward to the moment to go back into the theater to go okay where can i now take this further how far can we go right is, is ricardo just 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 thinking about this is there a work from the work that you submitted to us is there a work that you think contemplated this pro this, this kind of essentialism that you're talking about um uh that that, you, that maybe we can show the the audience uh, sh- sure. I mean, I can talk about uh, use uh, for example, Lost Highway that I did in London. It, it was a, a an opera, and it was based on the David Lynch film. And you know, the Young Vic. It was an E and O production. It was also at the at the uh, at the Young Vic space. We could have done the replication, the illustration of the uh, of of the house in L.A. We could have done a lot of those things. 
But somehow we felt because the nature of the music was now, it was electronic, it, was, it had a, a, a different feeling. We felt compelled to create something more akin to an installation in which the story then can happen, as opposed to creating an illustration of the story. And to me, what, it ha what happened, it, first of all, it liberated a, a kind of David Lynchian iconography that we could tell the story within the context of this opera in a way that was in the round, that you lived with these characters. And to me, that's exciting because yeah. it, it, it was a brand new thing. I shouldn't say a brand new thing. It was a way to use space to use elements of the of, of, of design within that space in which this, the, the characters can tell that story, as opposed to replicating, illustrating the, uh, the house and all of that, which I, I, I personally think that sometimes when the audience sees that, they know it's fake. So therefore, they cannot really get into the story because something is stopping them to surrender their instincts to go, okay, what, what, what's happening? Because all I see is a set. And to me, to me that's, a, that, that's an example of something that I want to continue working on. Right, so you're talking about essentialism, you know, sort of distil the distillation as, as an act of rebellion against the status quo, right? So you're talking about that. Then can I ask you, what would you say to folks who are saying, are you then in the process of essentializing or distilling something? Are you then actually not ignoring? What are you then sort of kind of turning against the idea of multiplicity that things multiple things can exist in one you know uh, simultaneously you know so so uh, and so i guess uh, to hold on to that question because i i want to i want to i want to look at Didi's work where it's very very complex and i i i don't know I think all of us have done Marie Antoinette, right? Yes, we all have. <laughs> oh no, no not okay. me. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that so so the the what what Ricardo was talking about is this essentializing as a as a as a form of not even I, I, maybe I'm general I'm, I'm putting words into your mouth, Ricardo, but it is a form of bumping against what would have been a, a you know. A, a, a plethora of symbols that lead to nothing, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And now we're looking at a multiplicity of symbols that actually, uh, for me, leads to a lot of things. Because, like, I can see this and look at, like, wow, this is such a comment on colonization itself. You know, mm -hmm. um, the, the layers of of uh, of pop culture, the layers of the odes to sort of like, you know. Western modes of dress. Um, talk a little bit about this and 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 why you submitted and why you, folks. Just for everybody who's listening, I asked these talented designers to send us work because that may have contemplated decolonizing design in both unconscious and conscious ways. So this is what Didi has sent us, one of the things that Didi has sent us. Can you talk a little bit about this? Didi? Yeah, so for me, you know, when Robert approached me for this project, the, one of the first things he said were that our three leading ladies as seen on the screen were black women. So that was my jumping off point. Yes, this is Marie Antoinette, but I first have to recognize and honor the actors who are going to be playing this role, right? And so I have to lean into that, right? And bring, and bring part of who they are to the costume. So with that, uh, you know, I started researching Marie, like what Mary Internet would wear. And then I sort of like threw it all to the side and said, well, what would this woman in today's world understanding, you know, your Kim Kardashian or Beyonce and influences of what beauty or, you know, what beauty is, how would she sort of take all those things and apply them to herself. So with that, that's why you have the YOLO, the on fleek, the bling. How will she sort of repurpose the idea of what beauty is, of what high fashion is, and sort of like translate that into something that um, speaks to who she is as a person. And that's where I landed with um, the combination of just black sort of iconography and the blonde hair, but tilted to the side, the color, the Afro, um, and just sort of like m mixing all these elements and ideas together to um, to to present her as to present these women as as 
as full, complete characters who are who are black, but are meant to be existing in a Mary Internet world or who are embodying Mary Internet. You know, and the question I always ask myself um, when I'm designing a show is what is beauty, right? So what are the standards of beauty? For me, beauty doesn't, you know, isn't what I guess the norm says is beautiful. I'm hoping to um, identify beauty, beauty that is specific to um, the actor playing the role and to what they might bring to the character. So like with this image, as you can see, she has an Afro that is sort of like styled up in a pompadour, like high up, right? But I'm, I'm, I want to acknowledge who she is as a black woman with this. I don't, I, that is to me is very important with my work. This is great. This is, I, I think part of, this brings me to my next question, which is like, is it possible to decolonize if in your identity, there is no history of colonization. Is that ever true though? Yeah. <laughs> well, but that's, that's my question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that, that is my question. What do you mean by that, Didi? I don't know if that's ever, tr I don't know if that's ever true. I think because to me coloni colonization leads to power is the idea of like the imbalance of power. I think that has been true throughout almost every generation or every sort of society, right? Yeah. Even in Egypt, right? There's, there's those who are in power and those who are not. To me, yeah. To me, I don't know that it's ever true that there hasn't so been. So what you're, what you're proposing is that in, in order, maybe, in order to sort of start this decolonization process is like to tap into your oppressed self, perhaps? But you see what I mean? Like so, to recognize so, your oppressed self and, and then to to push against that, right? To recognize mm -hmm. once again to recognize how much power you give to the other thing and to sort of take that back. Right? That's the unlearning for me of like, oh, I am not who you say I am. I'm just me. I am myself. And that is a, a every single day thing mm -hmm. and an approach. It's a constant unlearning. Mm. Mimi, you were gonna say something. <laughs> Oh, well, I mean, I was, I mean, I was just thinking about Ricardo, I mean, following up on Ric what Ricardo was saying. Um, I mean, I am in complete agreement. I think, um, you know, I am also always kind of trying to think about, it's not about how it looks, it's about how it feels. And it's about how this particular production and the alchemy of the particular people who are involved in this production will forge, you know, forge the thing that will move forth. But really it's about like, it's about how, you know, what, what, the, what the kind of rhythm of the piece is, what the tempo of it is and how it, and how it makes you feel. And so I guess as Ricardo was talking, it made me think about um, the production of An Octoroon uh, Brandon Jacobs Jenkins's play and you know which has it written in the script and the stage directions a very specific location of a plantation house but I agree you know with you Ricardo that that you know sometimes to represent that especially a historical location has this feeling of it being you know in the annals of history um, mm -hmm. and uh, and something that then the audience can basically kind of sit back and be like, well, that, that was then and this is now. And I'm watching, I'm watching mm -hmm. that thing that was yeah. then. And so some of the earliest conversations that I had with Brandon and Sarah Benson, who were direct, you know, who was directing this show at Soho Rep, you know, we were just talking about like, well, how do we, how do we want the, the audience to feel? Um, and <laughs> At one meeting, we sort of, I think Brandon made a gesture like, like this, you know, he was like, I want them to feel like, like this, um, and not, not just like be able to sit back complacently. Um, so, so on the one hand, there was that. And as I was thinking about how to approach the design of this play, I thought a lot, I mean, something that I think about a lot is materiality and the kind of connotations that are laden in specific materials. So, you know, for this particular project, as I'm thinking about um, a plantation house, uh, you know, the, a, a material that came to mind as something that could bridge that 
past and the, and the present and almost like a kind of banal day-to-day -day present was the cotton ball. Mm -hmm. um, so, so essentially I decided that, you know, the world that, that the plantation would be represented by people just knee deep in a sea of cotton balls. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then the fact I that, that. <laughs> <laughs> and then the fact that, um, that this, you know, this play was, taking from the original play, uh, The Yachtaroon, and was kind of, you know, a comment, a contemporary playwright commenting on this, you know, 19th century play, which was a melodrama, and has all these, um, you know, the, the different uh, events that happen in the melodrama. And so there's this event um, within the play where, where you know, the, the, the steamboat explodes. And, uh, and that's, you know, and and Brandon actually says like, well, I'll, you know, this whole thing was just to make, to make you feel, uh, to, make the, to make you actually feel something. Um, and so, you know, without going into a lot of details about the design, essentially there's a moment when the back wall of the set free falls down and the floor has already been covered in cotton balls and the force of the wind yeah. um, essentially propels all of the cotton balls into the audience. Um, and, I am al I'm always interested in like actually engaging the body of the audience member. Like I feel like to, to be present in that, in, in the event, um, in that moment of sitting in the theater together and experiencing this, like there's not really nothing more powerful than, than actually engaging the body. And, you know, one example is uh, when, when I, when we were loading in the set originally, for this production and I went in to check on how things were going and they had just rigged up the wall. Um, they're like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna test the wall for you. We're gonna let it free fall. And I sit down in the front row of the audience and it's just me, literally. And they're like, okay, ready? One, two, three. And they drop the wall and I'm waiting for it. And then as it's happening, your body has a reflex reaction. But anyway, so this, I mean, this is a photo of the, of the cotton balls being propelled um, into the audience and oh wow and really I loved that moment amazing amazing me, me too it was one of my it really I mean it really made me think of like you know uh, th that thing that you're talking about that you are designing for an emotional response right and also designing to full to 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 address an emotional need mm -hmm. right so there are like two things I, it, it reminds me very much of like Again, just going back to these sort of like uh, uh, indigenous and native like performance rituals, right? Like, which is basically theater and it's just like embodied. You talk about like the body reflex and like the performances, the, the, the nature of performance is so ingrained with the body that it is not separate, right? Like that, that, that the performance is actually informing existence. And one of the things that, that I think about is like the pre-Columbian, you know, the pre-conquest uh, Americas, the rituals of the Mayans and the Aztec, right? They literally were performing out of fear, out of fear that the sun, the fifth sun will not rise because if it doesn't rise, then their existence will be over. So in a way, the ritual performance, the nonstop ritual of performance, their existence hinged on that. And so I, 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 what I love about what you just said, Mimi, is that like, in a way, unconsciously or maybe consciously in the desire to trigger emotions and to address an emotional need you've decolonized theater design <laughs> <laughs> and woke them up and woke them up and woke them up <laughs> <laughs> um thank you for that that was that that was that, that was really great you know I, I one of the questions that has been sent to us is like in an effort to decolonize theater protocols will any of the representatives on the panel be willing to take on new works by black women and other women of color um i, I think this this talks about like will we work on i i i, I feel maybe we can talk about how much this talks about like who actually controls programming, you know what I mean? And how much we actually, uh, uh, how much of what we do is uh, contingent on who programs. What was the question again? 
In an effort to decolonize theater protocols, will any of the representatives on the panel be willing to take on new works by black women or other women of color? And, and is it, I wonder if it's talking about uh, uh, new plays, um, you know, or, or, or is it talking about the dearth of black female designers, which is a real thing, you know? Um, Or and to what extent asking, maybe or is it also uh, asking who can tell whose stories i don't know yes yeah what about that i mean let's talk about that it's the question of the day <laughs> it's the question <laughs> of the day it is a question of the day yeah you know, i think you know we we've, we've all we've all been having this conversations among us right like you, you know so yeah let's unpack that suitcase <laughs> it's moving. <laughs> if I may, if I may say, you know, I started my career uh, in grad school with Susan Laurie Parks. Yeah, the death of the last black man in the whole entire world. And then we did the America play at the public, which is what led me to meet Dorsey Wolf. Um. And then we've done many other things, including Borg and Bess and Broadway and some other, some other things. I, the question, I mean, I, if, if Susan Laurie ever calls me to say, I want you to do this, I have to be very honest. And, you know, I, I, anytime I get the fortune to, to work with someone like her, before I answer your question, Clint, my instinct, of course, would be, Absolutely. Oh, my Lord. Are, are you kidding me? Of course I want to. Especially now that I'm older, I know her well, and, you know, and, and, and there is a symbiotic relationship that we have in terms of visuals and text, etc. Uh, my answer is yes. On the other hand, now that I've been teaching for a while, and... I were to propose to Susan Laurie, you should meet this, this young, uh, rising uh, uh, African-American designer. I, I, I think that's, a, that's something that I would have to tackle in the moment because it's a difficult, you know, those are relationships, Clint, that, I mean, everyone knows this. Those are relationships that we've built through more than two decades. Um, I don't have an answer other than I'm conscious of obviously of the question and also that we have a duty to, to amazing, amazing rising designers out there. Yeah. Yeah. I, clearly I did not answer your question, but I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I mean, I'm, this is, this is all of us are, 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 are kind of faced with this conundrum. I mean, moreover, uh, I think, a specific kind of conundrum within the black indigenous and people of color designers, right? Like this is something that we have to think about like with, amongst ourselves, like what is our part in this, if the, you know, in this dearth, right? What is that, what is part, what is our part in that? And also about who gets to tell whose story, you know? And so it's complex. Like, you know, like I, I, I'm going to say this for myself, Part, when I got out of grad school, I couldn't get any work, right? And the first person who actually saw my work was George Wolf, right? And George said, come to the public, work on this, work on this. And so when there was not, when I think about like, should I just be telling Asian stories or specifically Filipino stories? I would probably be like, I, there, was, there was no work. You know what I mean? There was very little work. So to, a, to a certain extent, I was embraced by a, by a bigger community to do work for them. You know, come over here. Danai Gurira always says this, just go where the love is. Go where the love is. And that's, that's, that's where you will find your people, right? But now, as I look at my career, as I look at the opportunities that I've had, how much of the opportunities that I've had was a result of people being comfortable with, with me and being uncomfortable with people darker than me. And I, and I look at my work and I look at everything. Like, you know, you, as, a, as you said, Ricardo, it's about relationships. 
but I can I can no longer look at my work and not think about that, you know? Yeah. 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 Same. Yeah. I... Absolutely. But I also think I think the danger there is just telling one type of story. You know what I mean? Like it's so it's so tricky because there might be plays that deal, you know, there might be black plays that I will look at and say, you know what, I'm this is not a story for me to tell, right? So as an artist, it's it's very tricky because my existence is not singular. My story is like larger than that. My approach to the world I'm investigating or trying to uncover is is larger than how everyone else wants to sort of like pigeonhole me or how to, you know, that, that box they want to place me in. Um, so I think that's something that as a, as an artist, you have, and as, as a black artist, I just, you know, I just follow that in compass that's, you know, inside of me to say, well, is this socially, like, is this, you know, should I be telling this story? What is my intention here? Why am I telling this story? And how do I make sure I'm doing, telling the story to the best of my ability? That's what I lead with. Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah. Should, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know that it can be a flat out like, oh, just because I'm black, I should tell all the black stories. No, because I mean, yeah. there's so much wealth there. There's just so much there to uncover. And I might be able to tell one aspect of it or like reveal a, a truth in one part of it. But, you know, I don't know that um, being socially, I can, I, I'm meant to do it all. Yeah, I agree yeah. with that. I agree to that. We are all meant to do everything. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we're going to be boxed yeah. in a very, very bad position. And then who judges that boxing? You know, like, who is that person or persons? Since we're talking about decolonizing, who is to tell me, Ricardo or Didi or Mimi or you, Clint, that you can only work on this work? It is right. up to me as, as the artist to think about the question you raise in my position, in my life as a professional designer to say yay yeah or nay. But I also know, just to take it further, that someone, to, since we were talking about, or I, I brought up Susan Lori, she has a lot to say. Mm -hmm. And let's say that she were to work with George or somebody else. They know the world. They know the people working. And I think they obviously are entitled to who they want to work with. And in that sense, all of us are open to, 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 that, um, to that discussion or to join that design team. I'm, yeah. I'm very skittish about the, the Latins over here, you know, yeah. Latins over yeah. here, yeah. Asians over yeah. here, because that's not, that's not yeah. artistically, that's just not help anybody. But I think well, I, though, identifying though what, like if you do choose, any project you choose to work on though, like making sure you're clear about why you're telling that story, right? I think yeah. at, at least the intention yeah. behind the story you're trying to tell, like being clear about that, um, I think is not very Yeah, it's, 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 I'm just, I think part of, uh, completely in agreement with all of you, but also I just, part of, uh, I and mean, our really great colleague Anita Yavich says this, right? Like if the story mm -hmm. really speaks to you and you have such a desire to be a part of telling that story, then then I, I'm not gonna use the word license, you know, but, the, but, but then this is a, the beginning of a conversation. And on the other hand, as Ricardo said, we do have, this responsibility, you know, to our fellows, uh, I, because I don't think that they're separate, right? Like, I think all of this belongs in the same soup, access, mm -hmm. you know, what we're, the way we're telling our students, especially our BIPOC students, that, hey, the world is your oyster, you can have everything, you are literally entitled to design everything, you know, um, and uh, on the other hand, looking at who is marginalized within our community and say, hey, why aren't there enough black women in set design or in any other design? You know what I mean? So like, I think, I think these, I think part of the whole conundrum, not even conundrum, part of the whole thing here is to actually, can we all hold these truths, you know, because it's not an either or, you know, it is, it is, as you said, it is relationship is, it is about humanity. You know? And responsibility. Uh, I'll, I'll give an example without giving the name of uh, the, the production or anything like that, but I was part of a, a brand new play 
that was done at a Lincoln Center, Lincoln Center actually. And the director, we had read the play obviously, and we had signed up to do it. The director called us and said, I don't think this is right for us to be doing. She checked with every single one of us. We, we talked with the director and we said, we agree with you. We removed ourselves. And that was that. It's a, that, that kind of conversation that is about responsibility, being accountable if you're going to be doing this or not, is something that we all need to, 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 to think when we are offered these, these pieces or place like that. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of the the fact that we said, no, we're not going to be part of this production. And we were in agreement with the, with the director. And I think Ricardo, along with accountability is also when we, when you then give space to maybe like another person who might be better or right to tell that story, yeah. how do we ensure that they can actually do so without harm? How do we support, you know, I mean, along with that, cause you can get yeah. someone to, you know, give them access, but if they cannot, survive in a space that wasn't built to accommodate them, then we're, you know, it's all for not like, where do you go? So along with accountability is, um, yes. Yeah, reduction, you know? Yeah. 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 That's yeah. where, that's where I start thinking about, you know, process versus product. Like, I feel like when we talk about the word decolonization, like really like how we make the things that we make, is, is huge. And I feel like the way that in general, we are set up to make things in this theater ecosystem is very much, you know, along capitalist ideals and along white supremacist ideals and it values product over process. And, you know, when, you know, when you read, <coughs> read a little bit more about, um, you know, decolonizing design and aesthetics, you know, there is this, um, you know, where, where, where uh, non-Eurocentric aesthetics are, are really relegated to craft, right? Like there's this feeling that the, the handmade and things that take a long time to make are, are really more craft and they're not art, you know? Mm -hmm. And I've definitely had the experience working at, a, you know, at regional theaters or these kind of institutions that have very entrenched ways of working and deadlines and like, you know, like, we need you to give us the information and the drawing and all the information we need to acquire this prop or whatever, you know, without really taking into account the process of rehearsal and figuring out what it is. And like, so if you have a more organic process, sometimes that does not have a place in the way that we make theater. Oh my God, Mimi, this is like exactly, I've been like talking about this whole thing and not only, not only about like something that takes time, but particularly work by women. You know, I think I was just, I was just at the, at the, at the new Met and they just discovered Mrinalini Mukherjee, you know, who's this prolific unbelievable Indian sculptor who for the longest time was relegated to folk art mm -hmm. to, to craft and she 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 said I'm not going to show at any folk art institution because what I do is actually spiritual you know and so, so th th this idea that um uh that our that 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 decolonization is also actually deeply is, is about how we make things mm -hmm. is so important. And, and this leads to that question, like, you know, how, what are your thoughts about like breaking down all of these systems, the, the, the you know, the systems of urgency, the, 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 that can lead to overtime in shops to basically unhappy people, you know, uh, breaking down the basic structure of family for folks, especially BIPOC folks, which affects it, you know, so, 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 where do we, how do we, where do we go here? Like, what are like the, 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 the implementable steps that we can see, even like just maybe naming one step that you think could contribute to that? You know, Mimi just said something that is intense, which is in the American re regional theater, forget Broadway for a second, in the, in, or opera, which is another elephant in the room, regional theater. Mm. Um, the fact that there are um, they 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 function under a very specific structure 
of due date, of this, of that. Give me the drawing for this thing that cannot be built. It has to be found. It has to be real thing. And they don't respect if you're like saying, please, you have to buy this or blah, blah, blah. Here's the research. Make sure that you go get it. And they refuse to. And, and, and furthermore, even not having the, the infrastructure to allow the director with the performers and the design team in the process of rehearsal to discover things doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. That is one change that well, I, I, I agree with Mimi 100%. If we don't do that, we're going to be subjugated by very specific structures of delivery, delivery, delivery. It's, it's like a machine. We're not machines. Theater is not a machine. Mm-hmm. You have they need to, to be the- clear about it, though, right? If they're a machine and they just want to pump out something for money, say that, right? But if you say you want to create art, then give the space to do the art. But exactly. Yeah. And yeah. that very few people, if, if none, do that in this country. And, and I would say that that's, especially when we're dealing with more complicated places, you know, of diverse vo- voices and things that have to be authentic, we need to give a space for those theaters to provide that structure in which you can discover these things. Otherwise, what are we doing? Well, I, I actually think that it's so, in, in a way, the, the horizon is clear, you know, like the, I don't think, for instance, let's just look at the practice of 10 out of 12s, right? Yeah. You know, uh, that is so easily dismantleable and, and in the, in the re-appor- re-proportionizing, how do you say that word? Reapportioning. Thank you. <laughs> Reapportioning. My English is not very good looking tonight. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> oh, that was hard. That's a hard. The English language is a hard thing. Um, so, uh, in in that, in just sort of like the smart uh, 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 reapportionizing of time, you know, I think we can actually look at that because, like, all of us know that those last two hours are non-productive anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, but when you really look at it, sort of like as a general practice you're actually asking people to sort of disrupt their family systems. And for black, indigenous, and people of color, where where they've already marginalized and all the other governmental systems and all the other systems here, where the family is literally the, the source for financial, emotional, support, childcare for everything, you know, you're literally saying to these people don't have a family. Mm -hmm. And for indigenous people, particularly a people who is recovering from genocide. That's basically tantamount like you can't practice theater. Yeah, and I mean, I I think the bottom line is in order to reapportion that time, it means that there's going to be fewer, maybe fewer performances because tech is going to take longer. And the bottom line is that people are going to have to be, you know, producers will have to be comfortable with the profit margin being smaller. Like that's, I think that's what's at the end of it. Um, but perhaps a longer run. Yeah, like I, like, not I, necessarily. You know, I, yeah. They could still. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I wonder if that profit there. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of like our producer friends are gonna. I, I and I know, like for instance, Stephanie Ibarra is actually implementing this at center stage. You know, they've, and you know, there is there is a way to mm-hmm. look at the rubric so that it actually is just about a Rubik's cube. You know, mm-hmm. um, I mean, hopefully that's true. Yeah, I sometimes feel a little bit overwhelmed by the sort of economic structures that feel so entrenched. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I hope that there's a way. I mean, I also I want to go back to back to the, the, the process question again, because I feel yeah. there's one more thing that like, specifically I wanted to mention, which is about materials. Like I feel yeah. that, you know, in the world of at least in, you know, in our, in our set design world, I've often just felt that like the materials that, like if you want to use a different material, if you want, God forbid, to use like, you know, to go, you, to, go, to, go to a recycling center and you say like, I want the entire set to be found materials. There is nothing that a, set, that a shop, you know, dislikes more because it makes everything harder for them. They have to actually go and find the thing. You can't just order, you know, 20 sheets of plywood and, you know, 10 sheets of plexiglass, it's, you know, you have to go find the bespoke thing and that takes more time and, mm-hmm. and it's, you know, it's a pain for them. <laughs> but, 
But I feel that that lends itself to a homogeneity of materials and aesthetics. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. I mean, thank you. Yeah, this this will get me wild up right now, Mimi. But oh, come on, Ricardo. Material. <laughs> come on, Our right. material. This is why we're it's here. just it's a basic thing that when you go to the theater, you see a, a live actor, flesh and bones, right there. And all of a sudden, you see like a badly, oh, not badly, or beautifully painted, you know, wood grain. And you go like, why is that person real? This is very basic, obviously. Why is that person real? The lighting is ephemeral and beautiful. And then I see this wood graining. Why not just get the goddamn oak or whatever that is and let it be? Hmm. Oh, no, that's because that's not what theater is. Theater is an illusion. Make it look like we, the painters, can make it look like that for you. And I say, yes, if we're talking about illusion, but I'm not talking about illusion. I want the, the specific reality. If I, if I said glass, let's, let's look at different variations or what to look for glass or plywood or metal. Let it be, for God's sake. Why are you tormenting with this thing that I'm not asking? It is not what's necessary for the piece. For God's sake, let it go. Oh, we have to pay the scene painters. Like, that's a lovely thing. I know he has a salary or she has a salary, but we are telling a different story. Trust us. Let us do it. Materiality is key to theater. Key. Yes. Otherwise, yeah, no, it's fake. I think well, yes, but also, you know, uh, it goes towards authenticity and honesty as a process, you know, like we're, <laughs> you know, actually, I think part of it, too, is, is actually having a spiritual connection with the material and which is so lost, you know, which is like it, precisely what theater is, right? Like when we <laughs> when our friend Anita says, read the thing and if you connect to it. That's a spiritual connection to the material. But so when we're talking about like fabrics, uh, materials that we build the practice with, you know, we have to consider the emotional backbone of why that choice is that particular choice, you know? And it's just, yeah. You know, what I love most is the speech of like, well, that would mean that I would do this, 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 and this. And I guess that's what it would mean. Yes, you know, and 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 let's explore those meanings, you know. <laughs> um, I think what's profound about this is because then, as BIPOC designers, once we start actually, for me in my experience, I'm just gonna keep it in the eye. Once I express anything towards this need, towards this desire, I become labeled unreasonable <laughs> and compromising and. All the things. So here we go. Here's a question from Shaminda or Shaminda. Uh, I'm curious how the profession of design in American theater can be rethought to better amplify and support the work of BIPOC designers. Beyond hiring more BIPOC designers, what structures, policies, and practices in the relationship between designers and theaters need to shift to further decolonize the industry? Oof. That's a setup right there. That question is a setup. No, it's not. Be anti-racist. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Because I'm about, uh, you know, I have a lot of thoughts about this. So please go, whoever wants to, you know. So I, just said, I just said be anti-racist, right? It has to be a, like be anti-racist. You have to, you got to just start dismantling it one step at a time. And I, I think education is a huge part of that. In our schools, what are we teaching students education and then being clear that hey we're we are anti-racist and because of that we are no longer going to uphold a singular story for me a big thing right now is that we see these um these you know especially uh uh theaters hiring leadership of color secondary leadership and and so for instance um uh, we saw uh, Sahim, uh, Liliana, Whitney White, uh, uh, Miranda, um, you know, uh, going into these institutions. Uh, and as much as I 
want to so badly uh, celebrate it, I have a lingering question of what are we going to do to protect them? Mm-hmm. So, so to me, yes, equitable presence is important, right? And also they're going into predominantly white institutions. What kind of rejiggering of the internal systems are we doing so that these leaders of color and these artists of color are actually going to thrive? Because the, 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 the turnover rate is high. You know, um, and so to me, it's 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 about a, a really deep dive, and this goes to like designers of color. You know, yes, it's it's important that we start hiring designers of colors, ab- absolutely, especially the rising ones, especially Black and indig- Indigenous designers, right? But how are we setting them up for success? Is the question. Are the shops ready? Right. Are the stage managers ready? Are the front of house ready? Because these designers are ready. Let's be clear. They've been ready for a long time. So this idea of like, let's start with internships and all that kind of, I buck up against that because, you know, that perpetuates this myth that BIPOC designers still need to be ready. We're ready. A lot of the younger folks are ready. The question is for the institutions, how are you going to set them up for success? Now I blew up. (laughs) Go, go, go. Should I, should we go to the next question? Or Mimi, did you want to say something about this question? I mean, there's so much to say, and you guys have said a, you've said a lot. I mean, I guess I just would, the thing that I think about is access. Like, you know, yes, I think, the, you know, those who are here are ready. But I think there's, you know, I, I <laughs> this is my theme tonight, is like me getting caught up in the kind of larger structures, right, of all of the all of the hurdles and financial financial hurdles of you know low paying uh, you know non paying internships and all the expectation that you have to that you have to do all these non paying internships in order to get anywhere right in order yes. to be seen um, so I just feel like that is that is a big inhibitor and that's a big problem and when we yeah. go up respect us don't lecture us on how you do theater we know what we're doing. Yeah. Word. Just gonna sip of my tea a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, what's our next question? Sure. So we got this is an anonymous question. So oh. there's an increased interest in diversity, but it sometimes feels a little fetishized, especially if the power structure behind the production is still fundamentally white. In thinking about decolonizing theater, how have you as professionals navigated this seesaw between diversity versus tokenism? Hmm. Again, this is a setup. (laughs) (laughs) Lean into the setup. Lean into the setup. (laughs) I know. What does art equity say? Lean in. Lean in. Lean in. (laughs) Who wants to answer this question? Melissa, I love this question. Can you say it again? Like, like, what is it? How do we, how have we navigated sure. tokenism? Sure, and I'll send it to you guys too, so you have it in text. Uh, there's an increased interest in diversity, but it sometimes feels a little fetishized, especially in the power structure, if the power structure behind the production is still fundamentally white. In thinking about decolonizing theater, how have you as professionals navigated this seesaw between diversity versus tokenism? I question it. I'm an art. I question it. I ask. I ask questions. I, I, you know, it comes down to intention, right? So for those who are producing the work, what is your intention to do this? How, what is your social responsibility here? How do you expect this to impact the people you are intending it for? Like, I want them to be clear about that. I, I want to be clear about that for myself. So I question it. And I, I move forward or not based on that response. Yeah. And, and uh, I would also say, Didi, that um, this is a major uh, question for the younger, the, the rising BIPOC designers. For us who are established and being, be, they know what we do, they know that we fight, mm-hmm. they know that we're not gonna take it and all of that, but for, for, and we've fought the tokenism, of course, we've been part of it ourselves. But I think, I think for the rising BIPOC, it's, um, 
asking the questions, the whys is crucial. Mm -hmm. yeah. And where they're yeah. walking into. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I'm always all about do a 360 view of, you know, what that theater is about, right? Yeah. Is it just that one production or is it multiple, you know, what are the other community outreaches? Like, what are they, what are they, actions speak louder than words, right? So what are they really about? Yeah. And then from there, you make your decision or, you know, you make your, your choices. And I mean, when I first graduated, you know, something that was told to me was finding your tribe, right? So I think it's also very important to lean into your community or who you deem your community and to create art with those people. Yeah. Start from there as well. That community for us back in the day, Clint, you know, we had that, the public theater of Jersey Wolf. We could lean into that. And we yes. were supported, we were nurtured, we went to Broadway. We did many things. Everybody, yeah. actually. And, yeah. and that was not tokenized. That was the real deal. Yeah. And also, I think one of the things that I'm going to say is that, you know, in looking at the shows that I've designed um, and in looking at my participation in that, there are times that I feel like, you know, I wasn't completely successful in like questioning that it, there were times that I completely, you know, I looked at my position in there and I was like, ah, I'm voiceless here. Uh, or I feel voiceless. Right. And so, and then a lot of it is, is I think what I, what I wish for was that somebody not held my hand, but that I had uh, uh, somebody who, who, who told me, the real deal you know that you know that there will be times that you will be sort of anointed you know and then but because they built you they can also take you down so i think part of that for me is is how do i navigate it like i make a clear line now that i don't i have I mean, and, and I'm, I'm going to say this because I'm, I'm speaking from a point of privilege. Mm -hmm. I can no longer be the only one, you know, in any production. I can no longer be the only one. And I, and, and I say this because I think part of what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say is that it is, Ricardo and I have this like really big, like deep conversations about like how do we teach the rising BIPOC designers to, to become warriors and also monks and poets you know how much armor do they have to 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 build around themselves is it as much as we did and how can we what about those rising bipocs who don't want to build an armor who who say i i i'm not why are you asking me to build an armor you know, so then what do I, what is our responsibility in changing the landscape? So that particular BIPOC designer doesn't have to build an, an armor. So it's, it's, I, I don't know if I'm answering this question, but it's a complicated one because to a certain extent, a few of us seemed like we were chosen, you know, and a few of us, you know, um, were, were allowed to enter the house, you know, and and I and I look at I look at that and I look at my part there, you know, I, and I look at what that meant to young rising BIPOC and 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 it, you know it's it's so complicated, you know. I have a part in the colonization, Melissa. I think we're we're ready for the next one. Alrighty, um, this question is coming from Rodrigo. Do you ever feel like your responsibilities that come with a title, be costume designer, set designer, etc., are limited by the hierarchy caused by colonization or capitalism? I can read it again. Uh, do you ever feel like your responsibilities that come with a title, be costume designer, set designer, etc., are limited by the hierarchy caused by colonization slash capitalism? I for me, I find that question more alive when you're dealing with commercial theater because it comes with a lot of baggage, a lot of expectation, a lot of things that the producers are looking for on how to sell that product. That's very complicated. That conversation is very complicated. And I can say that I went through, uh, you know, quite the journey 
when I did Porgy and Bess on Broadway with Diane Paula, Susan Laurie Park, Audra McDonald, it was very tough. There was uh, that letter, for example, that Simon Sondheim wrote. I will never forget that. To me, that was the epitome of this white supremacist, if we want to use that word, and I think we should, of claiming that piece as their own. Mm. To which we said, no, it's not yours. It's everybody's, specifically the black experience. We're going to tell the story as we want to, not because you're, you're saying yay or nay to it. Actually, I'm sorry to say this, this might sound a little too, too extreme. I didn't care because I refused to be defined by that. I had to define that production anyway, what we did, but what we wanted to, what we wanted to do. But yeah, it's tough. It's very tough. And it exists. It's there. So mm. I, that takes a lot of courage and a lot of uh, vision and a lot of commitment to keep plowing through because the resistance is there. Hopefully tomorrow when the pan pandemic is gone and we're back in the theater, that resistance we, will be weakened. But as of right now, we'd be fooled to believe that it's not. It's there. Yeah. Mimi, do you have anything to add to that? Um, in terms of the hierarchy of like designers, you know? And yeah, yeah. I mean, what came to mind when I first heard the question is that I sometimes, I have often thought that designers are, are kind of um, one of the most mercenary in terms of the, the whole, cre you know, maybe not speaking about actors, but within the structure and hierarchy of, of directors, choreographers and whatnot. Like, you know, just by the nature of the kind of work, we end up working on a lot more different projects. So I, I feel that, you know, and, and that is partially dictated by the capitalist structure, which forces us to take on, you know, 10 to 12 projects yeah. a year because of the <laughs> fees that are paid in order to survive. So like there is a reason behind that, you know, that, that kind of mercenary, uh, you know, working on a lot of different projects at the same time. And so I do think that that, that definitely has an impact on how designers, you know, what, what our role is within the kind of core creative team. Yeah. Yeah. I feel, I feel for me, you know, because I do both, you know, there is a, a, a I uh, I am treated differently when I'm the set designer, and when I'm treated I'm treated differently when I'm doing mm. costumes, um, and uh, and that to me is a result of both <laughs> you know patriarchy and uh, 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 every, every every other kind of supremacy. You know, it goes back to this to what you said, Mimi, about like you know some things that are treated as craft and some things that are treated as art. You know, I think there is there's a lot there to think about, you know, even the way we are called, the order in which we are called at production meetings is, it's so hierarchical. Yeah. That's why I appreciate production managers who rotate those. <laughs> <laughs> so the set designer doesn't get to go home all the time early. Um, <laughs> Melissa, qu next question. Sure. So this question comes from Miguel. Uh, what do you think a decolonized theater in America, as opposed to American theater, would look like in 10 years from a functional and or aesthetic perspective? And what would be the most important changes from today in how we operate? I don't know what it's going to look like, but I do know that there is a new generation charging forward with different aesthetics. That I know. We see it in the new plays that's coming, that are coming out. We see it in the daring of those new playwrights. We see it in the new directors and we're seeing it with the new designers. I think it's a matter of time before the old timey stuff is gonna look but like a vague memory. I believe in that mm -hmm. actually. As to the other stuff, I cannot answer how it's going to unfold because as we all know, it's going to take time. But the forces of what's going on, uh, artistically speaking, 
It's, it's like the wind in a storm. It cannot be stopped. It just can't. I, 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 I 100% agree. You know, uh, you, when you look at the works, and most of them, I, I mean, almost all of the, the work that really push the boundaries are by these young playwrights, and almost all of them are BIPOC. Right? Yeah. You look at the work of Michael Jackson, yeah. Jeremy Harris, yeah. uh, 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 Jackie Sybil is Drury. Like, you know, I think uh, yeah. American theater would be, uh, uh, I wouldn't say, I would be remiss to actually ignore that because it is it is literally banging on the doors right and it's uh, it's inevitable it is inevitable and so to me it is both as we <laughs> say it is both a revolution and a renaissance it is coming it is already there it is already here and and i think american theaters and i and i, I, I and, and i would say all of them both commercial and not for profit the the most important thing you could do is actually open those doors. Literally, just let it happen. Because I think that, that, that to me is what's exciting about it. You know, new methodologies and new thought comes out of these works. I mean, how can we ever go back? I feel like I'm forever changed, you know, just from the last like three years and then this period from March to now, you, you know, yes, the pendulum swings back, but I just feel like in that swing, I, how can it ever go back to where it was? Also the economics of Broadway, selling tickets. How, how do we make that broader? So the most people can come, not just people that, you know, $400, but I mean, it's a lot of money for God's sake. That's, you know, Clint, I think that's on us though. Like that's on us people watching for it not to go back, right? Because yeah. if we look at our our world right now or look at the world in America today, people would have said, oh, they would have never thought, oh, America's progressing, it's moving forward, you know, politically. Yeah, people are like, oh, that's really happening now. Yes, it's happening now. Um, so that is on every single one of us to make sure it keeps moving forward. Otherwise, it potentially will just recycle back to hold each other accountable to reduce harm wherever we can. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, with all of you, I think it is inevitable and, and you know, we can't, sorry. <laughs> can you hear that yeah, in the background? <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to come in. And then, yeah. Let them. Let them in. Yeah. Let them in. Um, but, um, yeah. I feel at the same time, like all of the hope and all of the optimism and conviction that it can't go back, but aware of what Dee Dee is saying and that like, we, we have to be vigilant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for saying that Mimi, because it is, it is, it is, it, you know, it's not even complacency. It's literally a system that's been in place for a long, long time that, that it's like, it just snaps back, you know? Um, yeah. And those who are comfortable oh. have no need to push against the system, right? Well, yes, yeah. So. Yeah. And just to add a little bit more fuel to what we're saying, we've talked about Broadway, non-for-profit, regional theater. Let's not forget American opera. Yes. I'll, I'll leave it at that. And American training programs, come on. And that too, yes. You know, I mean, if you want to talk about patriarchy and white supremacy, let's look at the academy. Uh, oh God. Next question. I, <laughs> no, we're at time. They said we can go over a little bit. So maybe like one or two more questions. Okay, one or more. Are, we, are, are you guys cool with that? Are you folks cool with that? See, very patriarchal. <laughs> okay. All right, Melissa, two more, one more question or one or two. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, and I think this is, you know, I, I picked this question because I know we have a large student um, audience joining us tonight and I think you know I'm just curious to hear your answer uh, what advice do you give to BIPOC designers entering an industry built on hundreds of years of systemic oppression and how should the new generation of rising BIPOC designers fight for the decolonization of theater while still trying to break through in a white straight male dominated environment 
That was sent by Andrew. Uh, for me, okay, let me start with this, Andrew. I will go back to what Danai Gurira told me, which is basically go where the love is. Yes. Find your people. Yeah. And by people, I mean the people who support your work and the way you work. Mm -hmm. And find like minded people who are interested in the things that you are interested in, who are passionate about the things you are passionate about. Mm -hmm. Find your tribe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 100%. And, and, and I would also add while you're doing that search, finding the love and that, that, that world out there, find your voice, your identity, because otherwise you will continually be possibly be defined by others. Find that thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I have to, I mean, from personal experience in grad school, I had to find the things that spoke to me. Right. So it's like, yes, I'll learn what I have to learn, but also I'm going to find what speaks to my sort of truth and I'm going to practice that. I don't need to, I don't need to play by your sort of like your rules. I think that's the thing people also have to acknowledge. Um, you don't have to play by those rules. It's all like, it's, it's all false, right? Do the thing you want to do the way you want to do it. And it'll be fine. Like it'll work out. Yeah. I think I will have to go soon, but, um, <laughs> But I will say that I, the reason that I feel hopeful is that like the fact that we are all here and talked about all of that, like, I mean, part of the answer to the question, you know, the advice is like everything that we've talked about tonight and the fact that the young designers and young BIPOC designers are actually asking these questions. Because I feel like, you know, when I was just coming out of school, I don't know that I had the courage to, or, or knowledge to ask the questions. And I've learned so much over the years. And I do feel like this moment of renaissance and revolution is, is providing the space to ask the, ask, ask the questions. I think that's a great way to end, friends. Oh, I wish we could go on all night. But also, I think the next time we do this, I'm, I'm hoping that the next time we do this is around a dinner table where we can like eat yeah. food. Because I am so yes. hungry. What you <laughs> <laughs> What am I cooking? What are you uh, cooking for us? <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to be really stinky and spicy, but it's going to be good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. um, thank you all. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. And, thank you. Um, and uh, we'll... See you around. We have to give a big thank you again to our designers, Clint, Mimi, Didi, and Ricardo, for sharing your honesty, your passion, your vulnerabilities, your courage, your voice, your time. And thank you to the attendees for sharing your thoughts and for joining us. And to all of us for contemplating design in this way. Uh, be vigilant, find your people and your voice. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Bye, all. Bye. Bye.